Good evening, church. Amen. I was about to give up. The battle for the mind, it was too much. It was too severe. I thought, salvation is not worth it. Getting to heaven is not worth it because the battle that was going on in my mind, it was too much. It was too much. And I've been praying to God and I've been saying, Lord, please, erase my past. Erase the memories, erase the emotions and the feelings that I have because of the bad things that I've done in my life. And God wasn't doing what I'd asked him to. So one Sunday morning, I prayed and I said, God, if you don't answer my prayer tonight, I'm totally giving up. I'm giving up. I don't care. I'm giving up. And that night, I had a two-hour conversation with Charlene. And the one thing that stood out, the one thing that said, I can carry on, is this story. There was a girl, and she was sitting in a room. And she was leaning down on the floor, she was just crying, just holding herself crying. And the door was open. And this man just came in the room, and he had these big money boots on. And he started walking all over the beige floor. The floor was so clean. And as soon as this man walked in, the girl that was sitting on the floor, she ran over to the man and she was happy because there was a man in her life. And she followed this man around and all he did was make a mess of the beige floor. She didn't notice the mess. She just followed this man. And he made a big mess. And when he was about to leave, she took him to a table that was filled with bread. And she gave him the bread. He took his fill and he left. And when he left, she was all alone. And she knelt back down on the floor. She saw the mess and she was there and she was just holding herself because the floor that was once clean was now a mess. The floor that was once beige, that was once white, is now a mess. And she knelt down and she tried to clean the floor. But all she was doing was making it worse. So she got a sheet and she put it over the floor, but she tried to cover the stains. She tried to cover the mud stains, but she couldn't. So the door was still open, and another man came into the house. And her face lighted up. She was happy again because there's now another man. And she followed the man around the house again with these big muddy boots on, just making a mess. Again, she didn't notice the mess. She was just happy that there was a man there in her life. And when he was about to leave again, she took him to the table, she gave him his food, he took his fill when he left, leaving a mess on the floor. And she looked down and she saw that the place was such a mess, mud all over the floor, worse than before. She couldn't hide the mess. And she just stayed there in her house, crying, all alone again. And the door is still open, but there's a knock at the door. And there's a man knocking at the door in this white robe. And she keeps hearing him knocking at the door. And she lets him in. And the first thing that he does is close the door, he puts his arm around the girl and just holds her and she cries. And she just cries. And he kneels down. <laughs> and he lights the fire again that was once burning. I went home and it was about one o'clock in the morning and I prayed to God and I said, God, thank you for showing me what you showed me, but I know that I need to let go of my past. And I was praying all night and it was like I was in and out of sleep from about one o'clock until eight o'clock in the morning. And God was going through every single guy that I'd ever been with and show me why this guy's not right, this guy wasn't right, this guy wasn't right, this guy definitely wasn't right. And at the end of it, God said that the reason why they're not right is because they didn't ask to come into your heart. They just walked right in. And so eight o'clock came, and I sat up in my bed, and I said, Lord, I'm gonna let go. I'm fully gonna let go. And you know sometimes you hear your conscience, 
I couldn't hear nothing, my mind was blank. And I said, God, I really need to let go now. I said, okay, I'm going to do it now. And tears just came and I was like, God, I can't let go. Like, this is all that I have. You know, the memories, these guys, you know, this is what I live for. This is, and if I let go of my past, if I give my past to you, I'm going to be left with an empty hole inside. I'm going to have no memories, I'm going to have nothing. And so I said, Lord, okay, let me let go now. And still more tears, and I was like, God, I can't let go. I, ca I cannot let go of my past, I can't. So then I got on the floor, and I knelt down, and I said, Jesus, and still more tears came. And I said, Father, still more tears. And I said, I want to let go, but I can't. I can't let go, I can't let go. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And I said, Lord, I'm giving you everything right now. And at that moment, my mind went blank, literally went blank. I couldn't see, I had so much tears, I couldn't see, but my mind went blank. And I said, Lord, this heart of stone, make it a heart of flesh and just dwell there. That moment in time, I'm telling you, church, I felt a peace. I felt a completeness that I've never felt in my life. Never in my life have I felt such a, it was so surreal that it was like, I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven when we're in the presence of God because it felt like God was there with me. I was so complete and this is all that I wanted. This is what I was striving after thinking that a man could give it to me and he can't. There's only one person that can fill your heart. And so I said, I just want to stay here. I just want to be here because the peace is, is so nice. I said, God, I want to spend some time with you. I don't know what I want to talk about, but I want to spend some time. And I opened my Bible and it fell open at John 16. I've read this text so many times. And it said, your heart shall rejoice. This is exactly where my eyes went to. And your joy, no man taken from you. And I was like, God, there's no way that no man can take away this joy because you've given it to me. And then it said, and in that day, you shall ask me nothing. And I was like, God, there's nothing that I can ask you. There's nothing that I need right now. And it went on to say, verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And I was like, okay, God, but you know, there's nothing that I need to ask of you because I'm so complete right now. Then it said, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And I was thinking, what, what do I really need right now when I'm so complete? And I sat there and I thought, what do I really, really want? Am I gonna ask for a guy that I've been with, you know, bring me back into my life? No, that wasn't even on my mind. I said, Lord, I ask that you lock the door of my heart and don't let any man open the door again. And I pray that you just stay there and never leave me. And you know what God said? Chantel, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I want to call it Rachel as I prepare myself to sing a special item for me. The song that Chantal asked me to sing is entitled Use Me Lord to Do Thy Will. It's such a simple song, but it is so powerful, so that I hope you all will be blessed. Use me, Lord, to do thy will. Use me, Lord, to do thy will. As your instrument, I pray. As a shining light in this world of darkness, spread your love and truth through me. to do 
and it reads, she weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her, they are become her enemies. How is it possible that someone that was once your lover, someone that was once your friend, someone that you once opened your heart to, can become your enemy? How is it possible that among all the lovers that you or I have ever had, not one of them can comfort my heart or comfort my soul? Why is it that we weep? Why is it that we cry? Why is it that it takes the whole night to realize that this guy can't even, he can't even give me what I need? I remember growing up, this was my dream. Obviously I wanted to go to school, go college, go university, but one dream that I had was that by the time I'm 21, 22 is pushing it, I wanted to be married. By the time I'm 30, like again, 31 is pushing it, I wanted to have seven kids. Like I'd actually planned out, girl, no, no, boy, girl, boy, boy, girl, girl, boy. And there's a gap in between the sixth and the seventh child. Like, I was serious, this is my desire. I had names, I had first names, double barrel names, middle names, everything planned out. That's what I wanted, that was my desire. That was in my mind, so I drove. I wanted to, that's what I wanted. I got into my first relationship, it broke down after two years, and I was like, two years is kind of long, like, am I really gonna like, wait another two years, go with another guy to find out, actually, you know, he's not the one that I wanna be with. So I thought, okay, this was my mentality. This is where my mind was brought to. It was like this, I need to make my mind happy. I know I can clean, obviously, God willing, I can have kids. I know I can cook. Everything else, yeah, I know I can do. I need to make sure that my man is happy at all times, so that he's not gonna cheat on me. That was my mindset. As long as I can do that business, it was fine. So now it was like, instead of getting to know someone and being in a relationship for years and years to find that actually it's not, it's not working, I thought, let me just get to, the, get to the point, make you happy, yeah, you like me, yeah, you're falling in love because I'm great, you know. What, they, what did they say? Uh, uh, what's the saying? Uh, my mind's blank. Am I not meant to say it? <laughs> it's um, a, a chick on the street. What is it? Oh, a lady on the street. A lady street. on the street, yeah, but a, yeah, yeah, in the street. That's, that's, that was my mentality. As long as I can do that, my mind's going to stay happy. So I was willing to consummate before I'd even conversate it. That's where my mind got to. I was willing to do that before I'd even like gotten to know you because I had in my mind, I want to be married by the time I'm 21 and I want to have these, so I want to push out these seven kids before I'm 30. So, my mind was like this, go with different guys, you know, and it got to a point where it was like, I can't handle the withdrawal symptoms. You know when you be with someone and then you find that actually you're not right. There's a withdrawal, there's a period where it's like you're longing for that person and I couldn't take it. So someone said to me, Chantal, rather than go through that pain, just get under your next person and just hope that things work out. And that was my cycle. Don't work out, next person. Don't work out, next person. And you end up going in this cycle because you don't want to get to that, that period where you're having withdrawal symptoms. That was my dream. And that's why my mind was the way that it was. Because my mind had been programmed now to just get to the business. But little did I know that something was happening. Little did I know that my mind was going so far, so far. Turn with me to Songs of Solomon, chapter 3 and verse 1. Songs of Solomon, chapter 3 and verse 1. And it reads, By night on my bed I sought him, whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. There was one. There was one that my soul just couldn't let go of. You know, there was something about him, and my soul loved him. There was some kind of connection, and it was like a magnet. Like, I can't let go, physically, mentally, I can't let go. For you, he might be 
that baby father, he might be the one that you lost you know, your virginity to. He may be the one that has the best lyrics, but there's just something about him that makes you want to hold on. He's the one that your soul loves. But the Bible says that you sought him, but you found him not. The word sought means to try or attempt, to seek, to convince a person. So it became a point where I was like this, I'm so attached, I've done so much that my soul loves you that much that I'm willing to do anything now. And I'm trying to convince you that I love you that much. It's actually getting to the point where it's like, hey, I'm over here, I love you. Like, can you love me back? That's what happened, that's what happened. And on my bed, I try to convince him. On my bed, you know, I make phone calls and think, how can I get this guy to realize that I actually sincerely love you? So I think, God is love. Love comes from God, and he has given us the ability to love. And I used to think, why did God give me the ability to love someone that even got the cheek to love me back? I was like, God, why would you do this? Why would you allow me to go through this pain? Why would you allow me to go through this suffering? I really sincerely love you, but you don't want to love me back. If God really loved me, this is the point that I got to, if God really loved me, he would do something. If you really cared the way you did, for God so loved the world, if you really loved me, do something, God. And this is what happened. Turn with me to Jeremiah 27 and verse 22. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there shall they be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore them to this place. So somebody carried me to Babylon. Somebody carried me to that place that I shouldn't have been to. Somebody carried you to that place that you shouldn't have been to. Somebody carried you to that place where you said, you know what, I'm going to leave church. Somebody carried you out of the church. You know what, I'm gonna leave home, like, mom and dad, I hate you, move. I'm, I'm leaving, somebody carried you. When you decided, I'm not gonna be here anymore, somebody carried you, that's what the Bible said. So when I'm in my madness, why did God allow somebody or something to carry me to the place where I'm gonna receive this pain? Why would God allow this to happen? And this is why. Turn me to Isaiah 46 and verse four. I didn't realize that the Bible actually told the story of my life until this week when I was studying. And God brought me to a point where I was not depressed, but so like, I actually can't believe that I can look in the Bible and see my own life. He is so, he foresees the future before. God is just, God is too real. Isaiah 46 and verse four, it says this, and even to your old age, I am he, and even to your whole hairs will I carry you. I have made, and I will bear, even I will carry, and I will deliver you. That's the Lord speaking. So when I left, when I left the church and I said, I'm going into the world to do whatever I wanted to do, it was he, it was him, sorry, that carried me. He didn't take me there, he didn't push me there, but he carried me. Imagine this. I say that I want to go to the back of the church and my eyes are focused on the back of the church. I'm not looking down, I'm just looking back. But the road to get to the back of the church is full of coals and spikes. But I'm saying, I want to go to the back of church. Now my dad is standing there. He sees me, he sees the back of the church, but he sees the road that I have to take. And he knows my father loves me and he knows if I take a step, one step, I'm gonna, my foot's going to burn up, I'm going to stand on spikes. So this is what God says, I love you that much. And I'm not gonna force you because I love you, but because you wanna to go to the back of the church, I am gonna carry you. And you're not even gonna know that I'm carrying you because if I don't carry you, you're not, gonna, you're not even gonna make one step. That's God, because I love you that much. I am willing to carry you. I am willing to bear the burden. This is, imagine this is burdens, this is burdens. And if you're walking, you're down here, and this is the amount of your burdens. You can't carry this much burden 
So God is like this, I'm going to carry you so you're not here. So now you only have to carry this much burdens. That's God, that's love. He says, I have made, I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. So Jeremiah said that, I will restore you unto this place. Now I want to know how God is going to restore me. Because remember, I'm now in my madness, I'm now in my pain, I'm now in my hurt, I'm now so low that whatever happens, it's like I don't even care no more. God, I'm so wounded that I want to know how you're going to restore me. And this is what God says. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 15. The Bible says this, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. If God wants to restore me, if God wants to restore you, you have to give him your past. You have to let go. You can't hold on to it. I can't, I can't make you into what you want to be if you're willing to hold on to those things that are actually burdening you and actually dragging you down. God says, I need your past. But this is what else the text says. It says, that which is to be hath already been. So if something's already, if something's to come, but the Bible says it's already been, then it's already past. Are you following me? But God says, I require that which is past. So he not only requires your past, but he requires your future. He needs full surrender. I need you to give me everything. That's what the Bible is saying. And then we think to ourselves, well, I don't want to surrender to God. You know, we don't understand what full surrender really is. I used to think, if I surrender my life to God, does that mean I'm going to have to, you know, go to Africa and live under a tree and, you know, preach? That's what I used to think. Am I going to have to give up my house? Give up my, I don't have a house, but you know what I'm talking about. Am I going to have to do that? That's what I thought full surrender was. But that's not full surrender. Full surrender is where you actually see that just when you trust God and understand that he actually has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29 says, I have an expected end. You know, not, not, not for evil, but for good. And that's when you surrender. You have to realize that he's actually wanting to give you a future that is better than what you could ever imagine, ever imagine. Now, this is what happens when you surrender. Turn to Philippians 4 verse 7. It says, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when you surrender yourself to God, God gives you peace. That's what happened that morning when I felt something that was so, it was so super, it was a supernatural experience because it's never happened in my life before. I know it was supernatural. And that's the peace that God is willing to give you. Peace is returned unto you. Isaiah 27, verse 3. It says, I the Lord do keep it. He's talking about your heart. I the Lord do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it, I will keep it night and day. So God's saying this, if you surrender your life to me, I'm going to keep your heart. I'm going to keep it in the night time, I'm going to keep it in the daytime, in the winter time, the summer time. Any time, I'm going to keep it. Just in case anyone tries to hurt you, I am going to keep it. God doesn't lie. God makes promises and he keeps them. And God's saying, I am going to keep your heart. God does not force any man into his service. You know, he's not like the devil. The devil comes in and the devil is, we're not even going to speak about the devil's power today, but the devil's just deceiving. He forces, you know, he comes in through your mind, through music, through the TV, through video games, even through your partner, it's possible. And he gets you to a point where you actually have no hope. And the only how you get out of that situation is through the power of Jesus Christ. God doesn't order, and he gives opportunity. And the opportunity that he gives you is this. It's found in Philippians 2, 
and verse 5. This is the opportunity. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the opportunity, right? God's saying, I want to give you the mind that was in my son. I want to give you the mind that causes you to have a power that you could never imagine. Imagine this, you're walking through Brixton and a man comes up to you with a gun and he says, I'm going to blow your head off. This is the mind of Christ. Blow my head off. If I really wanted to, I could send like three legions of you know, angels to come down and just... <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? That's the man, like, that's the man, I have no fear. I'm not saying that, you know, God's gonna, you know, allow, allow you to do that, but I'm saying, that's the mind of Christ. No fear whatsoever. No fear. And God is giving you the opportunity. No sin. Did Christ sin? So he's giving you the opportunity to get your mind to a place where you don't even have to sin no more. That guilt. Never again. Never again. Philippians 1 verse 6, it says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God's saying this, if you ask me for the mind of Christ, I'm going to carry on working on your mind until your mind becomes like Christ. He says, until the day of Christ Jesus, not until the day that Jesus returns. I'm saying, I'm going to give you the mind, I'm going to work upon your mind until you have the mind of Christ. You know, Jesus might come in 20 years time, but I'm willing to get you to a point before that. That's what God is saying. I want to share a quote with you and it says this. Let no one suppose that conversion is the beginning and the end of the Christian life. There is a science of Christianity that must be mastered. There is to be growth that is constant progress and improvement. The mind is to be, is to be disciplined, trained, educated, for the child of God is to do a service for God in ways that are not natural or in harmony with inborn inclination. Those who become the followers of Christ find that new motives of action are supplied. New thoughts arise and new actions must result. But they can only make advancement only through conflict. For there is an enemy that ever contends against them, presenting temptations to cause the soul to doubt and sin. Besides this ever vigilant foe, there are hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil that must be overcome. The training and education of a lifetime must often be discarded that the Christian may become a learner in the school of Christ. And in him he will be a partaker of the divine nature. Appetite and passion must be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. There is to be no end to this warfare this side of eternity. But while there are constant battles to fight, there are also, also precious victories to gain. And the triumph over self and sin is of more value than the mind can estimate. Were we listening? I'll make it simpler just for those that weren't listening. Because I'll be honest, when I read it, I didn't listen the first time either. So it's like this, God saying this, don't think that because I give you the mind of Christ, it's going to be all happy la la. Don't think that. Don't think that. At that instant, your mind is going to be like Christ, just like that. Don't think you're going to be at a point where you can say, yeah, I'm actually... It's, that's what it's saying. Don't think that conversion is the beginning and end. It's a progress. You're going to have to progress. Why? Because there's an enemy that is fighting against you. But this is the thing. Every time you have a battle, you gain victory. Every time you gain victory, you become more like Christ. Do we understand? Amen. How many parts are there to an egg? Three parts. So what we've got? The shell, the yolk, and the white. Which is the most essential part of the egg? The shell. Would an egg be an egg without shell? Do you eat fried shell? No. <laughs> What's the most essential part of the egg? The yolk, all right. The yolk is the essential part, the inner core. 
In Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus says this. Matthew 11, verse 25, he says, take my yoke, the most essential part, take that upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. What was the most essential part of Jesus Christ? Was it his hands? His feet? Jesus still would have been Jesus with the hands and feet, but without his mind, <coughs> Could he have been our saviour? If I gave Christ my mind, would Christ have died for you? No, don't, no. Not even one, no. So without that mind of Christ, without that mindset, Christ would have been Christ. So Christ is saying this, basically, take my, take my mind, have my mind, and learn of me, because I am meek. And this is what meek means. I am mild, I am humble, I am plain, I am unpretentious, soft, unassuming, tolerant. Husbands, tolerant. I am modest. I am gentle, subdued, timid, children, peaceful. Serene, wives, they are patient. Wives again, manageable. Wouldn't you like to have that mindset where you, you know, your husband's actually Actually, no, no, that's the wrong way around. Men, wouldn't you like the mindset where your wives are manageable? Yes. All right. Yeah. Passive and weak. Don't it seem like there's a flaw there? God said, you know, he said weak. Why would you want to have the mind of Christ when it says weak? Imagine this. I've got a plate of food in front of me. This is my plate of food, so I'm going to decide what's on my plate of food. I don't need help. So I've got a plate, I've got rice and peas, got curry goat, some planting, fried chicken, okay, fried chicken. I got some, what? Oh, okay, a little bit of jello fries there. I got some roti, okay, some roti, a bit of, what's that stuff that goes with it? <laughs> okay, so that's my plate too. and I've got a big, I've got a big jug of um, ginger beer with ice. And I've got a knife and fork, and my hands are free. That's my plate, that's what I'm dealing with. God's saying this, I want to give you a hamper, and it's got some lentils, chickpeas, some salad, fruit and veg, um, buckwheat, what else? Wheat free bread, rice milk, it actually is nice, it seriously is. But he's saying this, you're not going to have no knife and forks and your hands are going to be bound. Which one would I choose? Would I rather deal with my curry goat rice and peas that I know is going to give me wind in the morning, you know? Or am I going to get the hamper but I'm going to have to rely on Christ to actually feed me because my hands are bound and there's no knife and forks? Which one would you go for? <coughs> Diarrhea. You get diarrhea. <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing. All right. You'd rather go for the healthy one. Remember, your hands are going to be bound and there's no knife and forks. But it's like this. Remember I said that you get all those good stuff in your mind, but your mind is going to be weak. It's the same thing. God's saying, I want to give you this hamper, but you're not going to have no hands. You're not going to have no knife and forks. I want you to depend on me to feed you. I'm actually going to feed you and you won't even need me to untie your hands. That's strength. I'm going to give you strength. Psalms 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is the strength of my life. John 15 verse 5 says, Without me, you can do nothing. So basically, you can have the mind of Christ. You're going to have that glitch where you're actually weak, but you need to depend on God to give you the strength because he's going to give you the strength. If he didn't give you the strength, you wouldn't even be able to tolerate your wife. Your kids, you know, they wouldn't be peaceful. Your husband's, what's that word? They wouldn't be manageable, nor would they be patient. So God gives you the strength to do that. There's another quote I want to share with you. It says this, God loves the youth. He sees in them great possibilities for good. If they will realize their need of Christ and build upon the sure foundation, he also knows their trials. 
he knows that they will have battle, battles against the powers of darkness that strive to gain control of the human mind. And he has opened the way by which young men and young women may become partakers of the divine nature. God has opened the way by which young men and young women may become partakers of the divine nature. Turn me to Second Chronicles 20 and verse 17. Second Chronicles 20 verse 17. says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Guess what? We don't need to fight in the battle for your mind. He says this, set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation. God has already won that battle for you. This is how you set yourself. The Bible says this, first of all, in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, it says, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Remember, God doesn't lie. He's told us that this battle of the mind, we don't need to fight it. He's told us that the battle is not ours, it's God's. This is how we fight the battle. This, this is how, no, not how we fight, this is what we need to do. Set ourselves. This is how we set ourselves. Turn me to Psalm 16 and verse 8. It says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So you set yourselves behind God. Always looking towards God, always looking towards Christ. That's how you set yourself. But let me tell you how you don't do it. You don't stand to the right and put God there and carry on doing your madness. You can't carry on, you know, watching rubbish on TV and expect God to win the battle for your mind when your mind is now filled with horror movies and fighting and all that stuff. You can't do that. You can't put your child in front of whatever foolishness he's watching and expect God now to fight the battle for you. You have to set yourself. So you have to keep God in front of you, not to the left, not to the right, keep him in front. Set yourself and stand ye still. As I get ready to close, Psalms 18 and verse 39. It says, for thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast sub subdued under me those that rose up against me. So when Christ, when you set yourself with Christ before you, God gives you strength, ready for the battle. I want to tell you a story. And the story goes like this. Who is the word of God for? Any age, right? Everybody. So imagine this. There's a five-year-old boy, and he's standing there, and God says to him, I just want you to stand here, set yourself, stand here, and see the salvation. So he's five, remember, he stands there, and he's looking out, and he sees all these, like, fat men just running towards him. They're running, remember, he's five. So to him, these men are kind of scary. So they're coming towards him, and he can hear them chanting. And as they get closer, he just puts his eyes, puts his hand like this. And when he looks through the hole, he sees it's just KO'd on the floor. And he doesn't understand what happened. And he says, you know, what happened? Like, I didn't do anything. The men were just knocked out on the floor. What happened? God says this. He says, I told you to set yourself, and you set yourself. And I told you to stand still, and you stood still. 
I said to you, the battle is not yours. And I said, you don't have to fight in the battle. He said, this is what I did. You know when you do steak out? Is it steak out? You know in the movies, where the white van, and then they watch the enemy for days and days. God's like, I did that already. You know, I sent my angels, we did that. We watched them for days and days. And when I knew what they liked to eat, what they didn't like, where they went, when I knew all that, I made the promise to you that you don't have to fight in the battle. The battle's not yours, it's mine, because I don't lie. Then he said, He said, I told you to stand still, and you stood still. And he's like, but I don't understand, like, but what happened? He said, you stood still with a breastplate of righteousness. And he looked down and he's like, I don't see no righteousness. And God's like, why would you see your own righteousness? How many people say, hi, I'm righteous. You don't even know that you're righteous, and you are righteous. And then God said, I put some shoes on your feet and they're gonna make you run and spread the gospel. And he's looking down at his feet, he doesn't see anything. And then he said, God said, I gave you a shield, a shield of faith. And he's looking and he's like, I don't see no shield here. And then he said, I gave you a helmet. And he's feeling his head, he's like, I don't feel anything. And then he's like, and I gave you the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And he's like, but I didn't say anything. When I took my eyes, when I went like this, everyone was KO'd and he was like, because it wasn't you that spoke. God says this, set yourself and stand ye still and I will, give, I will put on you the whole armor of God. This is the whole armor of God. It's found in Ephesians 6 verse 13. It says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God's saying this as I close. Can I please get a musician? As I get ready to close. something of you. Ladies, I require something of you. And it's something that you probably don't want to let go of. It's something that you're holding onto in your heart so much that you're actually scared of letting go because you feel that if you let go, you're going to be left with a massive hole. He says, I require of you the things that are keeping you bound. I require of you the emotions. I require of you the feelings that are attached. You know, the letdowns, the disappointments. I need all of that. Because you can't, you can't bear it on your own. You can't hold on to it any longer. You see the pain that you went through when your friend passed away? I need that pain. You see the disappointment that you now feel in your failed marriage? I need that disappointment. You see the hurt that you're going through? I need that hurt. I need it. I require it. I require it so that I can now restore you and deliver you to a place that you need to be. Not only do I require your past, God saying, I require your future. I'm not gonna hurt you, I'm not gonna hurt you, I'm not gonna harm you. I'm not gonna give you something that you know, you don't need, or something that, I'm not gonna give you something that's gonna stop you coming into my kingdom. I wanna give you peace. I wanna show you my love. 
I want to show you how much you care, so I need you to surrender your life fully to me. And only then, only then can you win the battle, the battle for your mind. Only then can you be restored when you give me everything. I'm going to make my appeal in two parts. The first part is this. If you want to give to God everything that's ever happened in your past, if you want to let go and allow God to deliver you and bring you to a place that you need to be, I'm asking that you come to the front and let me pray with you. Those things that are holding you, holding you bound, things that you can't let go of, the disappointment, you know, from your ex-boyfriend or your ex-girlfriend, you know, the one that really, really hurt you, I need you to let go. Let go of your past and give it to me. Because it's too hard for you to, it's too hard for you to bear and I need it. If you want to let go, come to the front and let go. See God's power this, this, this afternoon. You see the hurt, you see the guilt from your emotion. I need that. I need it. The second part of my appeal, if you want to be made like Christ, if you want the opportunity to have the mind of Christ, come to the front. The only way you're going to make it to the kingdom is if you have the mind of Christ. You can't make it any other way. With the mindset that you have now, you can't make it. You can't make it. God wants to give you that opportunity. God say, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus.
And I've experienced that rest, Father. I've experienced the peace that no man, no man, Father, could ever give in my whole entire life. Father, give the souls here peace this evening. As they let go, give them peace. As they give to you things that have been holding them down, holding them back, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you give them peace. As we let go of the death. As we let go of the abortion. As we let go of the disappointment in marriage. As we, as we let go of the death of our only child. The grandma, the granddad, the father and the mother. As we let go of father, I pray that you give us peace. As we let go of that partner, the one that promised that they'll always be there. As we let go of the promises, the memories, every single emotion, every single, everything that's, that's attached to something, as we let go, Father, I pray that you give us peace. I ask, Father, that you will now give us what you promised, and that's the mind of Christ. I pray, Father, that you will now start to work in us as we're confident, as we now fully believe that today, you can now start a work in us. I pray, Father, that you will start this work. As we become more like you, as we see how unrighteous we are, start that work, Father. Father, there are people that did come up to the front, and you know their hearts, you know why. As stubborn as they may be, Father, they can't resist the power of the Holy Spirit. So work upon their hearts. And I pray, I pray it's not too late. I pray it's not too late for them to come to you. I pray it's not too late for them to see the salvation that you promised. I pray that you allow us to set ourselves with you in front. You in front, always looking towards you. And today, Father, as we stand still with the whole armor of God, I pray that we see the salvation. And I'm asking this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we leave, before we move, I want to ask Rachel to sing a song for me. And as we meditate upon these words, I pray that you make this song your prayer this evening. Do 